Mayor Fuzzy here, reminding you to be engaged in your community. Your vote counts. Vote your choice. Let's hear your voice. Today, we're going to help you be informed. Stay tuned, and we're going to talk to candidate for Platinum's Parish District Attorney, Leo Palazzo, number 74. Now, let's get on to the show. Yaya Imagineering Studios with Plaquemines Parish DA candidate Leo Palazzo. Thank you so much for taking the time to come in and actually chit chat with us for a little bit. I know you must be super busy with your whole campaign and everything and everything that you're having to do. I'm very, very honored to have you in studio today. Well, thank y'all here, Yaya, for inviting me. I'm, I'm really am very impressed with what y'all have and I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about your program. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad to hear it. Well, uh, when we were actually researching a lot to do these interviews, we found out that a lot of people didn't really actually understand what the DA even does. Many people of all ages had no clue how it operated or functioned. So for us here and for our audience at home, could you explain the role of district attorney in the judicial process, please? I'd be happy to do that. I tell everybody that I hope you never need a DA. Because that means you, you're either in trouble or something happened to you. You might have became a victim of crime. But what does the, the actual DA do? The DA is responsible for actually working with the sheriff's office and our community. But he's, he has to interact with the sheriff's office and actually review the sheriff's investigation of a crime. And after he reviews the investigation of the crime, he then has to determine if there is a crime that was committed, if there's evidence to support the crime, and then whether or not he's going to charge the individual for that specific crime. So he's like a double check to the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office does the initial investigation. They then arrest an individual or charge an individual with a crime. The DA then gets a copy of that investigative report and has to go through it, fine detail, to make sure that it's a valid arrest, a valid charge, and it's based on evidence. Evidence that he could take to a judge or to a jury to determine if this person is guilty or not. If he determines right away what they call screening the case, that there is not enough evidence to charge the individual, then he should do the right thing and dismiss the case. However, if he believes that there is evidence to charge the individual, then he will charge the individual, and that's when the prosecution of that case begins. That individual will be called to actually go to trial and go to court and plead guilty or not guilty. If he pleads guilty, the case is pretty much over at that point. Then the judge just sentences that individual appropriately. 99.9% .9 of the time, people plead not guilty, and then the prosecution begins. And that requires sharing evidence back and forth between the DA's office and the defense attorney. That involves having motion hearings to determine what evidence actually comes in or is excluded. And then you get to the point in time when the DA will make them a deal or plea deal and the person either accepts it or he declines it. And if he declines it, then you go to trial. So the DA has a lot of not only a role in before a trial can even happen, but also has a process in making that trial even happen. Absolutely. A lot of, the, the DA has a lot of power regarding the judicial system. Power and responsibility, yes. And that's why you gotta make sure you do it right. You gotta make sure that you know what you're doing, you're, you're, you're looking at the evidence, you know the law, because you, you're talking about somebody's freedom. That's the highest you know, um, authority in the world. It's a when, big deal. When you're dealing with somebody's freedom, somebody's liberty, that's why the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. It's the highest standard that we have in the legal system. So you need to know what you're doing, you need to be able to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right, well, thank you for that very insightful 
explanation. I feel that I definitely got a better understanding now. Moving on, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the district uh, attorney office today, and how do you actually plan to address that challenge should you be elected? In this particular situation, this next six years, the biggest challenge that I see right now is going to be the budget. And I'll tell you why. The D district attorney's office gets funding from the state of Louisiana and gets funding from the parish. As we know, money is tight in government, very tight. Everybody's trying to cut, 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 um, especially in our parish right now. We're looking right now in our parish maybe like a $10 million shortfall in the budget, if not more. So that means my fees or my um, budget that the, the parish is going to give me is probably going to be cut. So I'm going to have to work with less money. But that's okay. I've done that before. I know how to balance a budget. I know how to operate something very effective and efficient. One of my programs is what's called a 90-day program. What happens is when we take a case, what we need to be able to do is we need to know, okay, this is a good case, and we're going to be ready to try this case in 90 days. Not a year, not two years, because the longer you wait, the more money it costs to keep that case open. So we want to make the cases get out of there as quickly as we take them, in and out, in and out, in and out so that we can save money and get the backlog of all those cases that are just dragging on for years. So that's the number one thing. Now, what do we need to do too? We need to go and get a little bit more aggressive and we need to go knock, go knock on the door up in, ba in Baton Rouge and ask them for more money. If the parish can't come up with money, then let's go supplement it with the money from Baton Rouge. In addition to that, we need to go up to Washington and go knock on the doors of our senators and our House of Representatives and ask them for some more money. We need to ask them for grant money to help us out. So those are the things that I'm going to be doing as your next DA. I'm going to find alternative ways for funding so that we can have a very efficient, effective staff to do our job. You know, adding on to actually being elected and your plans for being elected, more of in the beforehand, what unique experiences or qualifications do you have for your position that make you feel prepared to leave the DA office in Plaquemines Parish? You know, um, I've been blessed over my career as a lawyer to have helped thousands of people, thousands of people. That's what I do. I help people. I solve problems. And I truly believe in my heart and my soul that as your next district attorney, I could help so many more. What my experience is, is almost 30 years in the criminal arena, dealing with criminal law, knowing the ins and outs of criminal law, knowing how it works back and forth, knowing how to get the job done quickly and effectively. I also was the parish lead parish attorney where I ran the whole legal department in this parish, and I saved the parish millions of dollars doing that. Currently, I operate two multi-employee companies. One is a multi-lawyer company where I'm managing lawyers, similar to what I did as the lead parish attorney and what I'll do as your next DA. So I know how to manage, lead, motivate my staff to do the job right, I have the experience, I know the law, and I know what needs to be done in that DA's office now. Well, thank you for that. It's inf insightful to see that you also have business knowledge. I didn't know that you actually ran some companies that dealt with law and criminal law. I didn't actually know that. You know, speaking on criminal law, can you walk us through the actual process? Like, for example, once an arrest has actually been made by the Sheriff's Department, what happens next and when does the DA actually come into that process? Okay. Uh, just take your step back. Usually what happens is you'll hear a phone call. Maybe it might be a 911 call. And all of a sudden the Sheriff's Office comes out and they investigate what somebody reported as a potential crime. Once they investigate that crime, they'll have to write out a report. And from that report, they will look for suspects. And then at some point in time, they might arrest these individuals. Once those individuals are arrested, that's when the district attorney's office moves in. They take over. They review what 
the sheriff's office did. They reviewed their report, their investigation, whether or not the evidence supports that arrest. Was it done right? Because if it wasn't done right, then that case is going to get thrown out. So we're, we're crossing the T's and we're dotting the I's on the investigative report to make sure that it was done right. Once we determine it was done right, we'll accept the charge. If we determine right from the beginning that it was done wrong, we're required by law to dismiss that case. You don't want to bring a case that you don't have evidence forward with. You don't want to bring somebody that's innocent to court. That's a waste of time and it's, it's against the law. You know, everybody knows the saying, you know, with regards innocent until proven guilty. Everybody is presumed innocent. You have to have the evidence to support the case. If the evidence is there, and we, can, we have the opportunity as the district attorney's office to try to supplement that evidence, to go out and talk to witnesses, to go out and do more investigation to determine, okay, we have a case or we don't have a case. But if we do that and we find out that we do have a case, then it's our, uh, our position that we need to charge that individual with the right charge. We don't overcharge them and we don't undercharge them. We charge him with the appropriate charge for the crime. Once we do that, he comes in what they call an arraignment process. And he has the opportunity, the judge will read him the charge. And he has the opportunity at that point in time either to plead guilty or not guilty. Typically, they'll plead not guilty, and then we proceed with discovery, motions, and then trial. You know, moving on, we only have one question left, but before I actually ask that, I just want to thank you for actually taking the time to come in. I know how busy it must be, and I very much appreciate you explaining things. I feel like you've definitely helped me understand a lot of things. I didn't realize the DA office actually came in so soon and acted as a kind of overseer as well as checking everything. I didn't realize it had that uh, big of a role when it came to the actual process. Moving on to our last question, I just want to comment that it's a question that we ask everyone and although it always seems to be here for people who we ask, it's a pretty common question here and it's simply, if you can go back in time and give yourself advice at the age of 16, what would you tell yourself? Well, I think that's a great question, especially it's an appropriate question in this facility, Yaya, which to me, Yaya, the program is about artists. And one of the things that if at 16, and if I was back then, I would have told myself, learn how to play an instrument. I, I wish I would have played an instrument. My sister played the piano. My little brother played the guitar. Whole house full of music. <laughs> yes. And I came real close. I tell the story all the time. My uncle gave me a saxophone. And I was supposed to go to band, but the teachers said, no, you're not eligible for band. So I, I had to put it on the side. Maybe that was something God didn't want me to play an instrument. He wanted me to be a lawyer. I don't know. But that was one thing that I wish I could go back and play an instrument. One of the things my daddy used to tell me when I was little is he said that I had a beautiful voice. I could sing. I was an athlete in high school, but we had to take music. And I couldn't play an instrument, so I took choir. And I actually lettered in choir. I was a first tenor. But I wish I would have actually worked on my voice so that I could sing. One of the other things that I really would like to have done, and still hopefully one day I'll be able to do, is I like to write. And one day I would hopefully be able to like maybe write a book. I like to write poems. So I would like to do that. But when I, when I, I have a little boy now who's going to be 16 in December and when I try to talk to him about every day is I want him to smile more and laugh more because that's what it's all about it's it's about trying to make your life as happy as you can it's a small small thing that you can do that goes a long long way to change how you view and feel about everything and perceive everything it's one thing that I went out of my way to do a long time ago I can't even remember when or why but I decided that for the rest of my life, every single day, I was going to do one random act of kindness, no matter what or who it may affect, but just because I could. And ever since then, I've definitely felt a lot more positive about the world and things. Instead of complaining about things, I like to try and go and do something about it before I try and complain 
about it or anything like that. You know, the instrument definitely speaks to me because I love playing instruments. I play music, I play guitar, I play a few different instruments other than guitar, but mainly guitar. And uh, it's definitely something that calms me and everything, especially in such a stressful life of high school and everything. It's really a center for me to de-stress and think about things and just calm down and enjoy something for once. I, I just want to thank you. And but that's that. a gift too. That's it a is. gift. And it makes people not only, I know it makes you feel good because you're doing oh, it, yeah. but it makes people around you feel good. You know, it's one thing when you can pick up a guitar or jump on a piano and play a song and people jump in and they're singing it. That's a great experience. That's one thing I love about music. <laughs> people could be in the midst of an argument and then they hear a song that they all like and everybody just forgets what they were arguing about. It is. It is. There, that's absolutely correct. Listen, I, no, I, I want to thank you guys and the whole Yaya staff. This was a great experience. I'm, I'm, it was my honor, my pleasure to be here. So thank you guys for that. Keep up the good work. Um, I'm looking forward to taking a tour and hopefully, you know, as your next DA, that we can do things together because I would love to partner with you guys so that we can put some of that artwork in the DA's office, some more of that artwork in the courthouse to give you guys more awareness, more support. I think this is a home run and I want to be part of the team. But in order to do that for the DA, I need everybody's help. I need young guys and young ladies from 18 and up who are registered to vote to go out there and vote. Um, we have early voting for the next few days, till next Wednesday and then November 3rd. Your voice, it, your vote is your voice, and it's very, very important that we get the right people in office, and I'm asking everybody to please come out and vote and support me. Leo Palazzo for your next district attorney, number 74. Thank you, my friend. Thank you.